This is Astrology Hotline. I'm Kyle Pierce, and we're going to be going over the forecast for the week of February 6th through February 12th, 2023. Focusing on the most significant transit of the week and wrapping up with a day-by-day astro weather report using the planetary days as our guide. This week I'm going to be focusing on Mercury as it is going to finally depart from its prolonged stay in the tropical sign of Capricorn and enter Aquarius on Saturday, February 11th. I'm doing some other neat stuff along the way. So if you want to get the scoop on this week's astrology, as well as learn a bit about Mercury in the sign of Aquarius, stick around. And if you want to keep staying up to date on the most current astrology, you want to learn more about astrology, or maybe you have a specific question about astrology or your birth chart, go ahead and gently tap with your pinky finger on the subscribe button. Check out Astrology Hotline on your podcast app of choice and peruse our back catalog of episodes covering a broad range of astrological topics, as well as a series on the basics of astrology. And then go ahead and send us your most burning astrology question, either by email at astrologyhotlinepod at gmail.com or leave it in the comments. And we might just devote an episode of the podcast to answering your question. Lucky you. Well, with that, uh, let's have a little gander at what Mercury is up to leading into its ingress into Aquarius. So we're starting the week off here on Monday with Mercury still here in Capricorn at 23 degrees. So still a little ways to go, but Mercury is now moving at faster than one degree per day, which means that it is starting to gain on the sun. So it's in a sense getting back up to speed, but also hitting the degree or Sunday morning, depending on where you are in the world of its retrograde station back in uh, back in December 29th. So we are no longer retreading old territory. We are moving forward on to new things. So you may notice some things that be started uh, around Mercury's station retrograde back in uh, back around the new year. Uh, maybe some of those stories are closing out or we'll be finally closing the book on that little chapter. And you can look to your own chart and whatever house uh, is represented by the sign of Capricorn to see where that sort of wrap up is taking place. And I want to know what house does Capricorn fall on in your birth chart? And what was your experience of uh, Mercury's retrograde in Capricorn? What area of your life might have experienced a bit of a reorganization period, a bit of a disruption? Maybe some things needed to be rehashed, sort of retooled, rediscussed. Let me know in the comments your Mercury and Capricorn stories. Personally, I feel like this one didn't hit me too hard. It took place in my seventh house. I can maybe think of some ways that it might have affected my partner more than it affected me directly. I think the way that I have noticed it is, particularly the the last few weeks, I've noticed within myself a particular mm, difficulty in communicating things um, in anything other than like just kind of simple terms. <laughs> it's uh, uh, There's been a, a lack of uh, imagination, I think, on, on our really kind of having to reach for kind of fresh new thoughts and ideas. And it's certainly not the case that uh, Mercury and Capricorn is not capable of that. You know, Capricorn as a sign is particularly focused on the plane of reality that can be felt and touched, seen and identified, you know. It's generally more oriented towards things as they are, and it's uh, it's almost like it doesn't necessarily occur to Mercury and Capricorn to add uh, any particular flourish or color to the words or language, unless it you know has a, a really clear and identifiable reason to do so. Hello, kitty. Yes. Uh, jeez, this cat. Okay. Um, Unless it has a, you know, sort of clear point to it, at least uh, on its own, which uh, for the last few weeks, it kind of has been on its own. Mercury hasn't really been perfecting any aspects with any um, of the seven traditional planets. Uh, We did get a trine with Uranus last week, which can, you know, be good for new ideas and 
sort of reaching into uh, uncharted space, you know, to some degree. But you got to consider that Mercury, is, um, Uranus is in another Earth sign, Taurus, which is not necessarily the most um, innovative of signs uh, on its own. It can be, you know, quite groundbreaking, right? But I feel like it's disrupting so much uh, physical, tangible, seeable, uh, lived life, like stuff that is, you know, a regular fixture in your day-to-day -day life, that it's almost like creating so many real-world issues to <laughs> um, retweak and address the uh, fires to put out that there's not like a lot of time to really reach into the, um, kind of the sort of collective soup of thought, you know, that may be easily accessed elsewhere, but uh, doing what Mercury does, communicating it, you know, organizing, curating, and disseminating, you know, that new information, it's uh, feeling a little out of reach, or at least the delivery uh, seems to be, at least for me, almost like caveman <laughs> speech, uh, to sort of work hard to get beyond the monosyllabic communication through grunts and kind of short sentences, uh, short sentence kind of speech, <clears throat> which is, you know, great for a lot of things, um, but hasn't necessarily been super conducive to the creative juices kind of getting getting going. Um, we're still in kind of very, uh, very practical, concrete terrain when it comes to Mercury, but I think we're going to start to see that shift a little bit. As we get beyond this kind of shadow period, the mercurial lens is not so inundated with kind of same old story, you know, well-trotted terrain, and into uh, potentially more novel situation scenarios, ideas. We're able to take a more novel approach to things, even if they are, you know, part of very well-established fixtures in our lives, right? I think certainly... Um, Mercury's sextile with Neptune, which we will be getting on Monday, certainly helps us um, dip our cup into uh, uh, into Neptune land, right? Uh, into into the uh, sphere of imagination. Um, but Mercury and Neptune, hmm, it's still uh, it can be a bit of a challenge to get the Neptunian ethereal sphere back to, to reality to translate it though you're certainly welcome to try and some of us may find success but uh, as we're moving forward through the week mercury is going to apply to a conjunction with pluto which will go exact on friday uh, probably around midday which is uh you no know, useful for drilling into the heart of a matter right uh, sort of deep investigative work peeling back the uh the layers of uh, of my patience, um, peeling back layers of those, you know, deeply entrenched, well-defined structures, uh, in our lives and perhaps dredging up, um, <laughs> a new perspective of, of some kind. And while this, uh, morning rising Mercury may be able to find, um, sources of innovation, uh, hidden sort of deep in the, the, the nooks and crannies or under the surface of what can be seen, I think we're going to get, um, a version of Mercury that is much more suitable to the kinds of things that we tend to want to do with Mercury, or at least a, a broader scope of Mercury's broad set of actions, uh, uh, as we get into Aquarius. Aquarius is an air sign, so Mercury has a, a natural sort of dignity in air signs, or sort of universal dignity. Traditionally, it was uh, assigned a sort of co-rulership along with uh, Jupiter and Saturn of all air signs. This is called a triplicity dignity or rulership, which will tend to give a planet a certain amount of comfort uh, and a certain amount of ease in doing its, you know, general operations, right? It can do business in signs in which uh, a planet has tri triplicity. It's easy to set up shop because it already has the permits, right? <laughs> it already speaks the language, maybe knows a bit about the market, it doesn't have to build all those things or acquire all those things kind of from the ground up. But on top of that, there's a sort of natural correspondence with Mercury and Aquarius. There is uh, an idea in some circles of modern astrology that says that Mercury is exalted in Aquarius. And while I wouldn't personally uh, ascribe to that 
interpretation of Mercury's position in Aquarius. Uh, Mercury is exalted in Virgo, but Mercury does quite well in Aquarius. Uh, it likes it there quite well. And the way I like to think about it is uh, Aquarius as an air sign, uh, temperament-wise, has a, uh, a warm and moist nature, according to temperament theory. All air signs have that, which is associated with the uh, temperament quality of, of sanguine. It's energetic, lively, sort of light and friendly, easygoing, social, you know, uh, wet enough to be connective and empathetic, sympathetic, emotional, but hot enough to move quickly and maybe occupy a more diverse uh, set of spaces as opposed to water, which tends to, due to its weight, be pulled down by gravity and uh, often needs to be scooped up in another vessel in order to be moved, right? But Aquarius, you know, being uh, Saturn-ruled, also has this sort of cool quality to it, cooling and drying, which, you know, in a lot of ways is kind of the opposite of the idea of uh, an air sign being hot and moist, wet, which sort of brings it back to the middle sort of temperament-wise, which uh, you think of Aquarius and the idea of fixed air. There's the idea of something being fixed uh, uh, as in it's not changing necessarily very quickly, and you can get air that moves, you know, in a single direction consistently, right? You could think of like a cloud floating in the air, you know, moving in a direction according to which way the wind is blowing, but sort of steadily moving in a particular direction. But there's also uh, another kind of fixed air, which would be sort of stagnant air or still air, which can have both negative and, and positive qualities. Naturally, stagnant air isn't always the healthiest or most refreshing. But I often think of the idea, I believe, comes from uh, Taoism. Um, is that when you're meditating, you're trying to achieve uh, the place of no wind, a place of stillness in the mind, which in one sense is kind of like no thought, right? But it's uh, really a little more like quieting the mind enough to focus in on a single thought and maybe carry that thought kind of towards its natural end, you know, focus on it uh, and develop it over a longer period of time. And that is the, the quality of thought that we get with Mercury and Aquarius. It has a, a sort of capacity for speed and energy that Mercury likes in all air signs. You know, Mercury can be curious, it can explore new possibilities, but it has this sort of cooling down that uh, facilitates focus and concentration. Sort of like a computer uh, one of the big obstacles to having processing power, more processing power, you know, increasing the speed that a computer is able to process information is uh, our ability to dissipate the heat that is generated from all that electricity running through circuits. Uh, with improvements in technology around uh, heat dissipation, the ability to cool off the computer as fast or faster than it's being heated up allowing us to stick more circuits and microchips, you know, in a smaller space, get more bang for our buck, if you will. And that sort of, you know, hot, cold, warm, damp, sanguine air, but also cool, dry Saturn that you get with Aquarius, sort of gives you the best of both worlds when it comes to Mercury. Those are sort of Mercury's two natural flavors. Uh, it has a air sign, Gemini, as a domicile, and it has an earth sign, Virgo, a cool dry sign as a domicile. So I can see, you know, from a symbolic and sort of elemental angle, why some people might get the idea that Mercury could be exalted in, in Aquarius. Because what we often get with Mercury in Aquarius looks like um, some of the more idealized qualities of Mercury. You know, we get some people who are very articulate, you know, methodical, critical thinkers, uh, that are able to reflect on things as they are, as well as imagine imagine and innovate new different possibilities. You know, Mercury's nature uh, being the planet that goes in and out of visibility through its cycle with the sun, does that more than any other planet. So Mercury is the, the translator between the seen and the unseen. You know, pulling from the abstract heavens uh, and communicating that, uh, sharing it 
in the form of language, translating thought into words, translating thought into action. And Saturn being the master of the boundary between the visible and invisible, you can see how Mercury and Saturn uh, can get along quite well, particularly when we get into Saturn sign of Aquarius, where we're dealing with what lies outside of the typical boundaries of, of the visible, right? Bringing those things back, or bringing what was invisible into visibility, as well as, uh, you know, taking what's visible and making it invisible. Uh, I don't know if you have any Aquarius friends, but they uh, are often quite adept at doing that at, at parties. Uh, I like to call it the the Aquarius goodbye, which is uh, basically just kind of being there and then not being there anymore, just sort of dipping and uh, not letting anybody know. But that is the uh, sort of unique privilege of uh, planets in Aquarius is that they, when doing well, you know, can inhabit that place between between boundaries. Think of Capricorn as a fortress, right, or uh, a land that exists, you know, within a border. Aquarius would be the frontier. But in many ways, the frontier is a space that is between the walls of two fortresses, if you will. And that is a space where there are varying degrees of authority <laughs> that maybe are, are exercised. You know, you can get lost in the woods, um, be attacked by bandits uh, or something, right? But it's through that space that we travel to different places, right? To different fortresses, to different islands of civilization, or different categories of human or naturally defined space. But uh, in Aquarius, we're not necessarily beholden to them. We can show up to the party, scope it out, have a drink, mingle a little, and disappear. Check out another party. And while that might not make you necessarily a uh, card-carrying member of the gang, right? It lends itself to a, a unique perspective, right? Somebody who can exist and do business in many different spaces without necessarily being attached to any one. So you can see why uh, some planets might do a little better in Aquarius than others, right? You know, wet, sticky, attachy planets like the moon and, you know, maybe Venus, depending on where it is in Aquarius, uh, are not going to be as sticky and connective as they would like to be in Aquarius. They're not going to find that sort of sticky connection <laughs> that they crave. You know, the sun is not going to find a solid core around which to build a personality or a, a sense of identity either. It, you know, it's a much more dispersed kind of space and a very impersonal sort of space often. But uh, when it comes to Mercury, you can kind of see how Mercury would be of all planets other than Saturn, the sort of most well-suited to Aquarius. But, uh, you know, it's a very long-winded way of <laughs> uh, maybe justifying the sort of qualities that you often get with people who are born with Mercury in Aquarius. There's often a sort of a dispassionate sort of quality or to, you know, the way that the, the mind processes information. And they're often very observant because it sort of gears the mind towards looking at things from the outside, that outside vantage point, that outside perspective. Aquarius in many ways uh, sort of sets up the ideal conditions to observe. To be an effective observer, you can't be necessarily a participant. But uh, Aquarius is also a very principled sign. You know, it's Saturn ruled. It wants to create uh, sort of fixed and solid ideas sort of intellectual positions, which you'll often get with people with Mercury and Aquarius, uh, but you also get a unique ability to focus on things for a long time, and sort of maintain thought in a sort of cold chamber. But that principled nature sort of uh, facilitates a kind of predisposition towards methodology, sort of creating uh, well-defined systems of thought, sort of uh, coherent coherent and logical ways of engaging with thought as well as communicating thought. And that focus on, you know, what lies outside of the known or of the well-defined often uh, lends itself to a, a unique perspective, um, but also an interest in deepening knowledge on topics or about groups or people 
or ideas that are not uh, specifically very well developed yet. They're sort of on the intellectual frontier or on the social frontier. And let me just give you a few names of uh, famous figures with Mercury and Aquarius. You get uh, Susan B. Anthony, very well known as a, a very vocal proponent of social reforms, such as women's suffrage, abolition of slavery, temperance, all of which started off as not very popular ideas, very much ideas that stood, uh, you know, outside the norm, right? Uh, she was also a very vocal woman in a time where women uh, were not listened to. Uh, Martin Luther King, Mercury and Aquarius uh, in the 10th house, two very prominent, again, very loud, uh, very vocal proponent of equal rights, um, also a uh, very prominent speaker on behalf of those who were in many ways uh, socially invisible or less visible or who had less social power. Easily one of the most identifiable and influential figures in the civil rights movement, in the United States at least, and uh, probably a close second would be Rosa Parks, also a Mercury and Aquarius. You also get uh, George Washington, who, you know, within his own circle, uh, certainly a member of an elevated uh, aristocratic class uh, in at least a local sense, but more broadly um, ended up being the symbolic and actual leader of a place that uh, existed on the frontier of known civilization, a place that hosted a uh, radical approach to government at the time, and a place that literally uh, separated from a well-established uh, power structure uh, the, the British Empire in order to form a new nation, which uh, obviously is the, the United States. But, you know, other big uh, innovative, innovative thinkers, Thomas Edison, Ben Franklin, you know, all people with uh, radical ideas, different ideas that challenge the existing system, who were able to communicate their position, able to advocate their beliefs on behalf of a larger group, often, on behalf of a group that was to varying degrees disenfranchised in many cases, but also having the sort of fixidity to stick to the position, whether or not it was challenged, right? Or in the face of challenge, you know, a willingness to be unpopular. It's one of the uh, many great gifts of, of Aquarius. <laughs> but uh, obviously that has a, a place and a role, uh, a rather important one. And particularly with uh, Mercury being a, a morning rising, in its morning rising phase uh, just now, which is a fa uh, phase of Mercury that is much more interested in, in innovating, it tends to be faster moving, you know, sharper, quicker, interested in, interested in uh, acquiring, acquiring new ideas, new perspectives, inventing, you know, new <clears throat> ways of doing things, new approaches, new styles. I think we can see how Aquarius might facilitate that that uh, style of Mercury a little better than Capricorn would. But you can also maybe see how Aquarius might grant a little bit more staying power to Mercury than it might have in, say, Gemini, where it has the power to burn through a lot of information, a lot of ideas, and a lot of words in, you know, clever and witty ways, right? But it's often with our uh, through our limitations that we refine and develop our sharpest tools, right? So I think a lot to look forward to with Mercury and Aquarius, especially because we're going to get Mercury uh, a little more in the mix, right? It's going to be co-present with the Sun, with Saturn, uh, applying to a sextile with Jupiter, applying to a trine with Mars, right? It's in the mix, it's in the action, and that's what Mercury likes. It's what Mercury, it's what Mercury likes to be, mixing it up. I think there's going to be a bit more of a free flow of, of thought and dialogue. And if you've been struggling with writer's block or maybe been stuck in a particular frame for looking at a particular situation, you know, aren't able to think outside the bun maybe, I think Mercury in Aquarius has your back. I'm certainly looking forward to it. I think with that, uh, let's... Let's go ahead and uh, jump into the uh, the day by day forecast for the week. So Monday we have the day of the moon, 
moving into the evening of Venus. So the moon, uh, just coming off of the the full moon that we had uh, Sunday, and it will uh, start the morning off, depending on where you are, either with uh, an exact opposition with Saturn, or perhaps just coming off of it. But a lot of us are going to be feeling that uh, pretty heavy Saturnian influence early in the morning, regardless. So i got to say it's looking pretty overcast. Might be feeling that tension between wanting to relax, do, you know, what uh, our personal will maybe calls us to, right? Want to do our own thing, want to let our, our lion's mane down, right? <laughs> uh, but Saturn's like, no, no, dude, sorry. You have obligations and responsibilities, so might be feeling that, that tension between what we have to do and what we would like to do, which should, you know, soften as the day goes on and sort of fall off on the east coast of the United States, at least, by around dinner time, maybe a little after lunch on the west coast, and I apologize to I non uh, North American audience uh, if I haven't mapped out uh, the time zones um, for you guys. But by the time uh, the moon moves into Virgo, we're feeling a little less heavy and feeling a little more focused, perhaps. But the moon is still pretty full, even though we're starting to disseminate some of that light. It's uh, a lot to digest, which I think uh, the moon in Virgo might be able to help us out with a little. Being that Virgo is associated with the guts, the the uh, all those tubes in your abdomen that do digestion, right? The intestines. So, you know, maybe being able to wind down a little bit as the day goes by, focus on what needs to be done. And maybe if we manage our time well, we get to enjoy the night of Venus with Venus and Pisces. Uh, starting to separate from the square with Mars. While it's still relatively tight, uh, a little tense, maybe a little edgy still, I think uh, our overcast Monday will give way to a sort of parting of the clouds and uh, letting some of that, that moonlight in. So I might be starting to feel a little looser, a little easier, and a little uh, open and receptive to the uh, pleasures Venus and Pisces may have on offer. So maybe not a bad night for maybe a little mini date night for those of us partnered. Or you may just want to veg out a little bit and curl up with a good book or engage in, you know, whatever recreational activity you prefer. I think we'll find it a fairly easy Monday night to, to relax, unwind, enjoy ourselves, and hopefully get a good night's sleep as we move into Tuesday, the day of Mars. Mars is starting to pick up, uh, you know, a reasonable amount of speed. It's going to cover a good two or three degrees this week, which is uh, quite a bit faster than it has been. So still a little sluggish, but uh, picking up speed, maybe finding our energy uh, a little more accessible, but still kind of unsteady. Uh, Mars is about as close to the sextile with Jupiter as it's going to get. Uh, which helps sort of stabilize and balance our activities on Tuesday, giving us a little boost, giving us a little um, bit of purpose and meaning behind our actions. But we will get a bit of a, a T-square between Mars, the Moon, and Venus about midday on the East Coast, and could be feeling a little grouchy, a little sluggish, maybe a little salty. Could be a little agitation, maybe some kind of restless sort of pent-up kind of energy. That maybe is hard to find a, an appropriate channel for. I would try to go for a run, maybe get a little bit of exercise on Tuesday, get some of that edgy, you know, energy out, and kind of get the blood flowing. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm gonna give uh, Tuesday uh, scattered showers, uh, the chance of thunder. Mm. <sighs> I think my cat Emily is feeling this uh, Venus Mars square. She is uh, becoming a adult kitty and has been feeling the, the call of nature quite strongly as of late, yearning, and her appointment to get fixed is not for uh, another week or so, unfortunately. So she's likely to be very vocal about her yearnings for some time to come. <laughs> um, anyway, moving into uh, Tuesday night, we get the night of Saturn. Speaking of uh, having to call our personal desires, uh, Tuesday night, Saturn 
Still an Aquarius, very strong, very Saturn, but uh, under the beams here of the sun at about 18 degrees. So feeling Saturn uh, much more internally. We'll talk a bit more about Sun Saturn next week, but uh, I think a lot of us are going to be doing a lot of self-assessment and assessing uh, the state of our lives and the state of ourselves, right, as we are just now and maybe wanting to reform, update, and upgrade. Uh, while Saturn's uh, insights are likely to be strongly rooted in reality, you know, Saturn's harsh. You know, it may be true that your <laughs> uh, that your spending habits are uh, a little careless or, you know, you're not very good at balancing your checkbook or maybe you have a character flaw or two. You know, we all do. But working with Saturn really equates to being able to look at these things, these flaws, these things we don't like about ourselves, about our lives, and taking in the information and identifying a structured approach to how we might change or improve. It requires a certain amount of objectivity that is hard to achieve when Saturn is so closely entwined with the sun, right? The sun is not an inherently objective sphere uh, of reality. It's quite the opposite, in fact. So maybe figuring out our, our commitments to uh, what we want to change, who we want to be, and um, setting extremely realistic goals about how, uh, how we might achieve them within, you know, very reasonable timelines. But, you know, trying to let it keep you up at night. That's why uh, Saturn is a a diurnal planet. This uh, ruthless uh, assessment and critique of what is is often the most productive uh, when we can do things about it during the day rather than at night when we're trying to unwind, relax, recharge. But then uh, leading into Wednesday morning, day of Mercury. Still have Mercury and Capricorn without a ton of company uh, and sort of hanging out by the uh, the gate to the underworld of Pluto here. And it's a little interesting, potentially productive, depending on what you're trying to do. Because there is a bit of a call to proceed down uh, some rabbit hole or another that many of us may encounter on Monday, or Wednesday rather, especially with the, the moon applying to a trine with Mercury throughout the day, one that has reception, uh, as Mercury rules the sign of Virgo. What Mercury's doing is very much uh, influencing what the moon is doing, and the moon is in a position to make a uh, more physical, tangible, and real what Mercury is doing next to uh, the hell mouth of, of Pluto. So, you know, I don't want to call it good or bad. Pluto gets a bad reputation to some degree, deservedly, but nine times out of ten, Pluto is more of the, the fear that comes from looking into the dark pit and imagining what could be down there rather than there being actually anything down there. So, if you're eyeballing a, a rabbit hole thinking about going down, you know, make a deliberate decision about whether or not uh, you really need to, what it is you think you might achieve. Are you likely to freak yourself out or is there uh, potentially something, you know, useful down there? Mercury Pluto stuff's often quite good for, you know, deep investigation, but can also be rather conducive of paranoia. Fortunately, it's, you know, a pretty short-term aspect. I think most of us, we are, uh, you know, aware of the weather on Wednesday. We can, you know, mosey on past that cave as much as uh, we may feel its pull if, you know, we don't need to be going down any caves right now. But, you know, if you have some time and some uh, emotional resilience to burn through, <laughs> then uh, plumb the depths by all means. But uh, I'm going to give Tuesday, you know, the thing with Mercury-Pluto is or just Pluto stuff in general, it tends to, to create a certain amount of tunnel vision. It'll kind of make us uh, focused on something that freaks us out, and it can make it hard to see beyond that thing, make it bigger than it really is. So I'm going to give uh, Tuesday, or Wednesday, rather, uh, foggy, low visibility. But, uh, you know, the waning moon, particularly in Virgo, can be good for sort of deconstruction of constructs like that. This could be good for, like, identifying the anatomy of a particular fear or phobia. Perhaps uh, that mapping out process might make it easier to kind of give it a place or put it within a, a larger perspective. So we will get uh, the moon here Wednesday evening or Wednesday afternoon-ish at 23 degrees Virgo uh, in a contra and Titia with Jupiter and Aries while simultaneously oppose Neptune, uh, which... Could be conducive to you know 
mapping that anatomy and weaving it into a sort of larger mythology of yourself that uh, may not be fully rooted in reality, but, you know, when it comes to uh, the stories we, we tell ourselves uh, about ourselves, you know, there isn't really a well-defined uh, line between what is, you know, objectively true and what isn't. I think uh, as we move into the evening of the sun, Wednesday night, uh, it's interesting. It's kind of like, um, you know, potential tension between the hero we make ourselves out to be in our personal mythology and uh, maybe our, our harsh assessments of what is. There's a bit of a, a backdoor clash, you know, between those two things and perhaps an opportunity to reconcile or reintegrate the two or work uh, the Saturnian plan that we're creating for rebuilding ourselves and our lives, you know, brick by brick, weaving that into a sort of new story. I like Saturn stories. Granted, I have, I have Neptune and, and Capricorn, so I suppose I'm uh, disposed that way. Me and everybody else between uh, 40 and, you know, 20 or so. If you don't believe me, uh, explain why The Walking Dead is still going strong after 12, 13 seasons. Uh, we love our visions of scarcity and apocalyptic doom. But uh, anyway, <laughs> moving on to Thursday, Day of Jupiter. We have our Jupiter in Aries, uh, once again, which has been regularly one of the better days of the week over the last month or two, and beyond for that matter. But, uh, you know, if you did your, your Saturn work last night, Wednesday night, you either avoided the dark cave of your soul or successfully navigated it, you may be feeling a little more of a spring in your step uh, on Thursday. You know, Jupiter and Aries is, if for nothing else, uh, great for motivation. Just think of a, like a personal trainer, which uh, I personally, I, I'm not a fan of someone yelling at me while I do physical labor, but I uh, I know it's a thing people, people like and people are into. <laughs> so, uh, you know, not a bad day to schedule an appointment with a physical trainer personal trainer rather, but, you know, also a good day to work with, uh, maybe how you do your, your own personal pep talks, right? How do you get yourself keyed up for, you know, your big events? I think with, uh, the Antitia between Jupiter and Neptune here, Neptune at 23 degrees of Pisces, and Jupiter at seven. So equidistant from that Aries Pisces cusp, we may be drawing our hype from, uh, sources not rooted in, uh, what we can see, right? things which we can find evidence for, perhaps, but that's sort of Jupiter's job, right? Jupiter's not generally in the game, in the business of uh, weaving illusions. He will make a case for what is possible and sort of offer support and the uh, ne necessary faith that is required to see certain things forward and through successfully. So, you know, as long as you're not getting too grandiose or untethered from reality with Neptune, Jupiter can take some of that uh, Neptune glitter and dress up your, your dreams and visions of what's possible and help uh, fuel your pursuit of something, which is fine as long as you aren't, as long as you don't base, uh, make major decisions around projections into the future that are, are unrealistic, right? Or are, are long shots, maybe, or not super certain. You know, this YouTube channel may take off and reach uh, 1 million subscribers by July of this year. It might, but uh, I'm not um, taking a, 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 any mortgages or uh, planning a, any vacations around that particular uh, swing in fortune, right? Uh, you know, use, use the hype as a resource. It's, you know, fuel. It's not money in the bank. Nonetheless, I'm going to give uh, Thursday, you know, let's give it sunny with a chance of glitter. And then Monday, uh, rather, Thursday night, Night of the Moon, which, uh, you know, if you live in the East Coast, Eastern Standard Time, the Moon's going to be, uh, Jupiter's going to kind of pass the baton onto the Moon. So uh, the Moon applies to an opposition uh, right around dusk, which is nifty. And uh, interestingly, right around the time the Moon makes a, uh, applies to a trine with Mars at 12 degrees of Libra and Gemini respectively, the Moon is going to form a Contra and Titia aspect with Venus in Pisces. Right around uh, 
3 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's an interesting little formation. You know, these aren't necessarily like easy aspects with the benefics, right? It's opposition. And Contra and Tisha is kind of akin to an opposition. However, moon benefic stuff, uh, moon, you know, Jupiter, Venus stuff, tends to be pretty positive regardless of the, the type of aspect. Even if it's not always comfortable, you know? So it's, it could be kind of a, I don't know, probably more useful if it wasn't uh, in the middle of the night. So, you know, hopefully some of you are able to make use of it um, maybe in the early hours of the evening, depending on where you are. But this is kind of, um, looks like something, you know, positive that is maybe a little harder to integrate. Uh, this kind of looks like the moon potentially getting a little... Break it down like this. Uh, moon and Libra can be a little uncomfortable because Libra is a little more social than the moon would tend to like. You often see, you know, varying degrees of social anxiety with the moon in Libra. And this kind of combination between a trine with Mars and these aspects with Jupiter and Aries and Venus and Pisces, it's a little like... Uh, Sort of cajoling the moon out of a out of a rut, maybe, or out of a, you know, staying home and watching Netflix alone, uh, and maybe instead going out to the bar, meeting some new people. Maybe somebody, some of you might get uh, talked into going uh, on a blind date of some kind, <laughs> or uh, you know, coming out of your shell. You know, it's it's not uh, the moon's comfort zone is not necessarily being facilitated here, but the cajoling of the moon out of her shell, you know, might uh, yield a positive results, if not altogether comfortable ones. So I'll give a uh, Friday night, uh, Thursday night, you know, clear skies, but maybe kind of windy. Windy with uh, high humidity, maybe. <laughs> it's a little sticky, slightly uncomfortable. But then uh, Friday morning, go move into the day of Venus. Uh, and Venus is a lot happier this Friday. You know, still within range of that square with Mars. Venus at uh, about 18 degrees. Pisces, Mars at 12. But, uh, you know, moving on from from the controversy, perhaps. Or, uh, you know, if any of you out there experienced a, a rupture in a relationship or an argument or even a breakup, you know, Venus is kind of moving on and, you know, starting to feel herself again, right? And as she approaches... Uh, conjunction with Neptune, you know, maybe daring to dream again, you know, <laughs> seeing uh, uh, many ways to transmute, you know, a difficult situation or enhance an already positive one, often with Neptune uh, by use of mind-altering substances, perhaps, you know. Uh, a Venus-Neptune you know, you know. in Pisces, quite good for good times, enhanced by chemical aids uh, as, as long as you just you don't overdo it right so you know potential night at the bar might want to go a little harder than usual It'd just be safe out there guys because uh, you know by the time we get to Friday evening we are in uh, Mars town it's the night of Mars and while this is a uh, nighttime Mars which uh, you know tends to facilitate uh, the more constructive qualities of Mars being a nocturnal planet and all Mars's uh, intentions aren't always pure, so go easy and go with friends. Uh, Mars and Gemini is uh, in his own decan right now. The second decan of Gemini is uh, Mars ruled in the Chaldean order, and Venus ruled in the triplicity system. So Mars has a you know a bit of a power there. It's kind of a, a sexy decan of Gemini. I don't think. Uh, David Bowie had any placements in this decan, though I do want to check, but, uh, you know, there's that sort of uh, androgynous quality that you'll get there that can be, you know, quite alluring. But there's also sort of a duplicitous potential. This could be a bit of a con artist kind of Mars in some scenarios. It's the ability to uh, be two things at once, two opposite things. Uh, you know, be those things uh, at the same time, but maybe interchangeably. It can be a little bit of a Dr. Chekyll and Mr. Hyde type of vibe. So, you know, whatever you're dealing with Friday night, just don't necessarily assume that uh, what you see is what you're going to get uh, consistently. There's a lot of Neptune-Venus glitter sort of floating around, creating, uh, making things look a little, dressing things up a little, creating some magic, but while some magic is real, most of it's not. So... You know, just use your, your sense sensibilities. All right, I'm 
going on on this way too long. Uh, Saturday, day of Saturn, might feel like a hangover. Drink some tomato juice, go for a run. Justify your Friday night extravagancies with some Saturday discipline. I'm giving it, you know, kind of an overcast because it's sun Saturn. Probably a low humidity, you know, dry. And then uh, Saturday night, night of Mercury, just in time for Mercury in Aquarius, which I'm going to give a, uh, you know, moony, I guess, since it's nighttime. Clear skies. I like it. And then Sunday, day of the sun, we got sun, <sighs> sun Saturn, getting pretty tight, so, you know, getting organized, uh, maybe implementing some new structures, getting clear on uh, harsh realities, that sort of thing. Um, just hopefully not, not being too harsh. Finally, wrapping it up with Sunday night, the night of Jupiter, when all the best TV is on, uh, I'm going to give it sunny because, you know, The Last of Us is on. Can't complain about that. Good way to spend that night. And uh, I'm always tired by the time I get to Sunday. So with that, I'm going to call it, call it a week, folks. Uh, thanks for tuning in. As always, you can book a reading with me at kylepierceastrologer.com. And if you're interested in learning about the 36 decans of the Zodiac, join us on the Three of Wands Discord three Tuesday nights a week at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, where we go over the meaning and significations of whichever decan the sun is in. Uh, I believe this week we'll be talking about Aquarius 3. So we'll be going over about 2,000 years worth of images associated with that decan, pulling those images apart, looking for the symbolism, and seeing how uh, the stories that those images describe show up in the qualities of the Deccan, right? And they really end up being great discussions, uh, especially the more people that participate, you know, uh, well, often able to get some very, uh, draw some very interesting meanings out of the images, uh, the more heads we put together on it. So I'd love to see you there. With that, I'm calling it a night. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll see you next time. If you have a question you'd like to hear answered on Astrology Hotline, shoot us an email at astrologyhotlinepod at gmail.com.